As I understand it, uh, I'm Craig Huffines with the American Hereford Association, and uh, as I understand it, I'm the last man standing between you and, ho and the hospitality hour. So uh, we're going to try to wrap this up uh, this evening, but before we talk about the American industry, um, I want to reflect uh, just a little bit on how far we've taken this breed Hereford uh, in the last 16 years. And that was the first conference that I had the opportunity to attend in 1996 at Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, how many of you might, might have attended the, for that conference? I know Jan, look at the hands. Henry, I'm sorry I did not get to make that, uh, that one in 1992 in South Africa, but um, if you reflect back in Fort Collins, the theme of that conference was quality, carcass quality beef quality and so as a result of that conference many of us around the world began focusing on carcass quality ribeye scanning and so world hereford conference was instrumental in moving our industries forward in 2000 in buenos aires how many of you might have made the buenos aires tour several hands yes in buenos aires in 2000 the subject of branded beef was discussed Branded beef. At that time, the American Hereford Association was just five years into its branded beef program, and both Uruguay and Argentina had launched during that year their first branded beef program with the Hereford label. Hereford Prime had been launched in Australia, and it was getting, at, at, was it a little bit later than that, Jan? Much earlier, like 1992, uh, Hereford Australia had already started the Hereford Prime. But as you reflect back to Buenos Aires, now today there are over eight countries now supporting multiple Hereford brands. In 2004, in Australia, how many of you made the Australian trip? Several hands up, yes. We talked about global collabor collaboration. We talked about international genetic evaluation. We talked about how we might be able to compare genetics in the various contemporary groups around the world. And we started on a, on a journey uh, into the science of comparing genetics from uh, Australasia and North, and North America. And then in 2008, in Copenhagen, Denmark, the very first use of genomics, the technology of genomics for identifying genetic defects in our population, what once we basically threw the baby out with the bathwater in fear of propagation. We now have a test in which we can diagnostically identify problems in our herd and basically save whole populations of Hereford cattle around the world. Today, today I've, I've heard uh, some of the most inspiring country uh, reports that I have ever heard in the five in the five conferences that I've been able to attend. And so I want to congratulate Dr. Church, Dr. Cross, Randy Rendell, Gordon Stevenson, the entire Canadian Hereford team, along with our Secretary General, Jan Wills, for taking this breed from what was a very difficult time in our history 20, 16, 20 years ago, to what now I would consider at this conference a resurrection of an old industry icon, the Hereford breed. And I think we all owe each other a big round of applause and a celebration at the end of this event. So I digress and we'll move into the American industry and I wanna talk about three basic things. I wanna talk about the uniqueness and unprecedented times that we are currently in. Um, I wanna talk about some of the strategies uh, that we're involved in at the Hereford level. And I want to talk specifically about how Hereford is going in the United States. Um, we've had some tumultuous uh, issues related to Mother Nature uh, with drought uh, that has reduced our cow numbers dramatically uh, in the last two to three years. Couple that with uh, record growth in exports of U.S. grain-fed beef internationally. Uh, and then what we've heard all day, the growth internationally of live cattle genetics uh, into Russia, into Kazakhstan, and the Russian satellite states 
have put a great deal of demand pressure on the Hereford breed in the U.S. And we have seen historic prices for Hereford bulls and females in recent years. I'll show you some charts in just a moment, along with new breakthrough ceilings and feeder calf and fat cattle pricing. So as we see the, the, uh, the shrinking of the nation's cow herd in America, coupled with uh, unprecedented demand for Hereford genetics globally, obviously that's impacting price. And if it weren't for the severe drought conditions last year, the year before, and this year, I think we would see some massive expansion of the American cow herd. The U.S. cow and calf population is 92.6 million head. That's the lowest number of cow and calves since 1951. So the drought has had a major impact on the U.S. population. However, however, we produced more pounds of beef last year than we've ever produced with those numbers of cows. So breed improvement, uh, science, modern technology, modern technology and nutrition, animal health, animal physiology, we've been able to keep up with the demand for beef production in the U.S. The American Hereford statistics, today we have just right under 5,700 adult and youth members. 3,700 of those would be adult members. So we have a large youth group as well. Just over 97,000 cows on inventory. Those are all registered cows that are in production that we keep track of on an annual basis. And 65,000 registered calves last year uh, were reported uh, to the American Hereford Association. This is the trend over the last 10 years for Hereford registrations uh, in America. And as you can see, it's been fairly stable, fairly flat until we get into drought years and we dropped off in 2008, 2009, along with the economy uh, crash that we saw. But I want to report to you that this year we will be ending our fiscal year in August and we're seeing an 8% increase in registrations this year, a nice rebound despite the fact that we've seen these record droughts around the United States. So we're very excited about that trend line and we believe that if we had some moisture we could see that expansion go even further. Let's talk a little bit about strategies. Uh, we put a lot of thought into how to reposition the Hereford breed as we lost market share through the 70s and 80s, how to rebuild that market share back. Enhancing EPD accuracy through genomic technology is a major initiative uh, that we're embarked on today. We've all talked about our respective breed improvement programs, the BLUP models, the evaluations that we currently use. We believe that eventually we're going to be able to augment that technology with genomic testing so that perhaps a bull calf that hits the ground might have the same accuracy for birth weight as a bull with maybe eight or nine progeny. And we think that is very real and in the near future. We're, we're working very diligently to increase the use of proven genetics through AI technology, through the new ET technology that's available out there. And we've seen a great deal of improvement in use of that technology across the breed. In recent years, we've uh, conducted head-to-head -head economic uh, comparisons, proving the value of Hereford cattle in crossbreeding systems. Uh, we have a sea of black uh, cows across America, and we've worked very hard to prove how Hereford can benefit that crossbreeding system and add dollars to the commercial cattleman's uh, back pocket. We've also added value through our Hereford branded beef program, it's been a struggle, a 16-year battle in the trenches, so to speak, in the food industry, but we've made great progress in eliminating arbitrary discounting of Hereford cattle that occurred maybe 15 years ago to now reaping rewards and premiums, passing that back through the system. In 2003, we've made, since 2003, we've made great improvement in AI use. We're up 34% in the number of calves registered uh, that were AI calves. ET is seeing great strides and improvement in growth, 77% increase in ET since that time, and a 51% increase in domestic semen sales since 2006. We attribute that to a couple of different things. One, 
the extensive use of, of EPDs, young sire testing, and uh, using those proven genetics to create predictability in that calf crop. We're heavily involved in collaborative research. We've heard some of that here today uh, between the American Hereford Association, Canadian Hereford Association, Uruguay and Argentina are both involved with our own U.S. Department of Agriculture. Dr. Dorian Garrett is leading the charge from Iowa State University along with the uh, other universities from Nebraska, Missouri, and Illinois in a global attempt to discover, discover those markers within the DNA that can help us make better predictions uh, within our EPDs. And so we will be launching a EPD or an enhanced EPD this summer uh, where we'll add a little bit more of that genomic information to hopefully just increase that uh, accuracy slightly. Uh, over time, uh, we think this will become more and more robust. And of course, the Pan American evaluation, uh, we spent a great deal of time since uh, 2000 and, uh, 2004, the Australian uh, conference, working on ways in which we can collaborate across populations. Uh, of course, South, North and South America is a very strong trade area for genetics. And uh, we've been working very diligently with our partners uh, in South America. And last year, we launched the first Pan American run. And I think we're all very pleased with how that's turned out. I'd like to remind you that in the United States, there are an estimated 20 million cows out of the industry's 32 million beef cows that have a black hide. Uh, that means they're predominantly Angus, but not necessarily straight Angus. So there's also 10 or 11 other breeds of cattle that have adopted a black hide color. And so consequently, 75% of the nation's cow herd can be considered Angus influence. About five years ago, we decided to take a different tact at addressing that issue and so we began to talk about crossbreeding. Now 22 million cows need a lot of Hereford bulls to put a white face on them. And so that's been our objective in the last three, four years is to convince those producers with black cows to use Hereford bulls. And so with research that we've conducted in California at Harris Ranch, uh, Circle A Angus in Missouri, and with uh, the big company out of Idaho, Simplot, uh, we are developing real-world heterosis figures and economics to back that the black cow is actually a lot better economically if she has a white face. And so that has really begun to trigger market share shift in her for genetics and uh, with real-world power behind the data and the numbers. Consequently, we're seeing a resurrection in the Hereford breed in America. Uh, here's a trend line from 2002 on bull cell averages up through uh, 2011. Uh, last year, bull cells were just over $4,000 average. Females right at 3,000. Through the spring of this year in 2012, bull cell averages broke over $4,500. Female sales over $3,700. So in two years, we're seeing about a 35% increase in the prices paid for her for genetics. And so we're starting to see the shift, much like we've heard today uh, from many of your countries, that shift is global. Uh, and we're seeing the, the prices paid and uh, we're, we're the top selling breed in America today. In 2010, the American Hereford Association commissioned a survey that went out to uh, approximately, I wanna say 100,000 cow-calf operators they were subscribers of Drover's Journal. And they were asked, what breed of bulls do you wish to purchase in the next three years? And we listed the various pop most popular breeds. And what came back to us was one out of every four of those producers said that they were ready to buy a Hereford bull. Compare that to five years ago, it's about a 66% increase. And so again, uh, in the United States, we're seeing a massive shift in the demand, in the interest in her for genetics. And we again believe that it's partially due to the sea of black that needs crossbreeding, but also the effort that our breed has taken in breed improvement performance. Our youth, we've 
We've heard several countries talk about youth, about how do we attract youth back into our business. Uh, very important to all of us. Uh, I'd like to share with you that this past week, uh, we just hosted the largest Hereford show in the world ever, if my numbers are right. 1,351 head of Hereford cattle were shown at Grand Island, Nebraska last week, representing nearly 700 young people from age 9 to 21 years of age. It was the most inspiring thing that I've witnessed since I've been involved in the Hereford breed. And so without our youth, we'd have no future, but folks, we have a future. And it's so exciting to see these young people. They spent 10 days of vacation time with their families coming in from 37 states to participate in this wonderful event. And we're so proud of it. And uh, we think uh, that we have a tremendous model for leadership development and for creating enthusiasm for the Hereford breed. With that, um, again, I think, uh, I think we deserve a celebration. I think, uh, I think if you hear, heard the, uh, the reports today like I did, much different from reports in the past. We see market share growing across the globe. We see new countries coming in as Kazakhstan and Switzerland interested in Hereford genetics. We see prices paid for Herefords unheard of in our lifetime. Uh, and we're all embracing technology in some form, right? Whether it's uh, in our models for genetic evaluation, whether it's collaboration in genomics, or whether it's in branded beef marketing. We are all taking the steps to move this and elevate this breed in, in, across the globe. And uh, so tonight, let's celebrate. And with that, uh, again, I'd like to thank the uh, Canadian Hereford Association Planning Committee, and we look forward to the rest of the week.